here. All right, maybe I'll go use the restroom then. And we can start. All right. Yep, we're ready to start anything. Okay. And uh, the nearest restroom is just through that door. Or what? There, there on one? Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. Has anyone ever considered climbing Everest? No. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Has anyone climbed Washington? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome, awesome. They're completely incomparable, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's what we got. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, the stairs, yeah. There are many stairs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah this, is, this was a pretty incredible feat. Uh, right, yeah, yeah. And to um to choose a a new route, you know, one that hasn't been done before, is is pretty unique. Uh, for those joining us on Facebook, we'll be uh, getting started in just a couple minutes. Mark, is it okay with you if I lecture without a mask, or should I keep it on? Uh, as long as you are six feet away from uh, the other participants, then you okay. can take off the mask. Afterwards, though, when we do um, yeah. questions or if it's sure. still, if you're off, that'd be good. Yeah, I feel more comfortable speaking without a mask. Yeah, I think that is, uh, that is fine. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, do a I'm real all, quick introduction. Okay, I'm all, I'm all set. Yes, you're all set. Um, one, one quick question that I had for you is, will you is the, the, the camera is only pointed over here. Correct. You can move the camera though and point it over here, perhaps? I, I can pivot it. It won't, um, it'll be at a, at a long range. So you'll be small over there. Okay. But we can do it. It's a little shaky. So as much as possible, um, it'd be better. If uh, I was over there. It'd be better if you were over here. Okay. Um, when we do the introduction and when we close out. Okay. In the middle, when can, uh, people online around, are gonna I see. Move around a little bit. In the middle, you can move around because it's going to, we're just, the people online are just going to see your slide. Oh, okay. Okay. That sounds good. Uh, so, welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming out today. We are so excited to have Ed Webster here to talk about uh, his extraordinary adventure heading up uh, to the summit of uh, Everest. It was a treacherous adventure of a, um, a previously unclimbed route. And so, uh, we're very excited to have him here today. Let's please uh, give a round of applause. Um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Kaylee, who's here, and Kaylee, who works for the Guilford Library. We have been emailing back and forth for approximately a year, and so this is really taking a lot of doing. Uh, it was postponed when the pandemic started, and now rescheduled for tonight. And so I'm delighted that the day has finally arrived, and and that we're all here together, and that includes everybody who's watching from home. Uh, hopefully with your family and your kids. This is a family-friendly uh, lecture about Mount Everest, uh, the history of the mountain, but also this amazing expeditions that I participated on, three separate expeditions to Mount Everest back in the 1980s, which uh, nowadays, uh, yeah. this is the ancient history on Everest. Because I was on the mountain uh, in Nepal and also twice in Tibet, I'm one of the few climbers who's climbed on every side of Everest. And tonight during this lecture, you will see all three of these expeditions, but we're going to concentrate mostly on the third expedition. The first one was in 1985 in Nepal, the second in 1986 in Tibet. And the third expedition, the really big one, the important climb, this brand new route up Everest was the 1988 up the east face of Everest known as the Kangchung Face. You probably have not heard of that side of the mountain because to this very day, that side of Everest, the east side of the mountain, has only been climbed three times ever. And our team, no one's climbed it in over 20 years now. 
uh, 25 years old. And so our team did the second ascent to that side of the mountain by a brand new route without oxygen bottles, with no Sherpa climbers helping us, with a four man international team, All right. no radios either, not even a radio. So, this third big expedition that I went on in 1988, when I was 32 years old, was a really major climb. It's one of the really big climbs on Everest. And, uh, and I, I know you're going to enjoy this story. Um, I wrote the rock climbing guidebook to the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Um, some of you that are rock climbers, the Rock Climbing Cathedral or White Horse Ledge, you will recognize this little, little Bible shaped book. Uh, they're out of long, out of print. I have one extra one here if anybody's interested in it. Yep. Uh, fail. But um, Rock Climbs in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. I, I wrote three separate editions of this book. And this was the Bible for three oh, generations of climbers. In oh, the just came back. This is the photographs of all the climbers, all the routes. And I followed that up with my Everest books, Snow in the Kingdom, which took me 12 years to finish. And uh, it's also out of print. And I have some autographed copies here over on the other table. I'll just mention uh, for anyone who's watching at home that if you're interested in buying a book, you can email me at my email address is Ed Webster in lowercase run together at MTN as in mountain, Ed Webster at MTN imagery. I am a G E R Y dot com. So Ed Webster at MTN imagery.com. And my other website is edwebster.org. So that's how you can get in touch. And I have some posters. Quickly, because we have a lot to cover tonight, I wanted to uh, show you some of the equipment that I brought along. So we almost, we almost died on this new route on Everest. We ran out of food for four days on the way down. All of us were frostbitten. And if you look carefully at my hands, you'll notice I lost eight fingertips to frostbite from Mount Everest. I also lost three toes on my left foot. So the front of my foot here, of my shoes, is empty. So eight fingertips and three toes. My partner's also got frostbite, not quite as bad as mine. On the way down, my partner fell and they dropped their ice axes and lost them. This was the only ice axe that made it down the mountain. It's a very ordinary ice axe. It's like a $75 ice axe. You know what? In my mind, this is one of the most famous ice axes in America. It saved the lives of three people doing a brand new route up Everest. One of the three American new climbs up Everest. So. You should touch the ice axe while you're here, and you'll notice it's still cold <laughs> for all these years. Um, I've got some other climbing gear. Uh, this is the harness that I wore on, on the new route up Everest, it's the Willens harness, a new one. I also want to come up and touch these boots because these boots, my British partner, Stephen Venables, on our new route up Everest. He wore these boots to the summit of the mountain. So I got 300 vertical feet from the top. I never actually stood. It was very, very pinnacle. I got 300 vertical feet from the top. I was, I was about an hour from the summit before I started passing out. Remember, we climbed Everest with no oxygen bottles. But Stephen got to the summit. I don't know how he did it. No oxygen, alone, in a whiteout. He had borrowed my extra pair of boots because these are size 13. He got one extra layer of socks in there and his feet were a little warmer. So he wore my boots to the summit and then he gave me back the boots. So I didn't get to the top, but these purple boots did. <laughs> so I like to bring them to lectures so that you can touch a boot that's been to the summit. Okay, so why don't I go over here and we'll start. Uh, one other thing I wanted to show you. So um, I'll stand over here. So 
when I was 11 years old, I was interested in the outdoors and backpacking and hiking. But one day, my stepmother, Dorothea, she went to the local library. I grew up in Lexington, Massachusetts, right by the Battle Green. And she brought home a copy of this book about the first American descent of Everest. It's called Everest Diary. It's not a particularly well-known book, but she gave me this book and said, you know, Ed, I thought maybe you'd be interested in reading this. And boy, was she right. I think I memorized this book about the first Americans to climb the mountain. And this book inspired the rest of my whole life. So I became the climber after reading this book. Little could my mom have ever realized that I would end up going to Everest three different times, climb a brand new route up the mountain, get into the history books of Everest. Little could she have imagined that I would also meet and even go climbing with some of the climbers who are in this book. I just talked to one of the guys on the phone a couple of weeks ago, and he's 89 years old now. So I've become friends with some of these very same climbers. What a wonderful story. And my mom, bless her, she just passed away. She was 96 years old uh, a few months ago, but she knew that she had changed the course of my life so much for the better. And it all started with one library book. What do you think of that, Mark? I love it. Isn't that great? Yeah. <laughs> it started with one library book from the local library in Lexington. And my mom said, would always say to me, as she was in her wheelchair, she was, I'd kneel down by her and she would say, Ed, I'm so glad that I got you that library book because you had a great life. So thank you, mom, for that. So. All right, let's go to the mountain. All right, I'm going to give you a hand to now the clicker. Uh, the clicker. All right, there it is. Put it over here. <clears throat> okay. So we're going to uh, share. Okay. To do uh, this keynote. Okay. Yep. That's it. My favorite image of Everest, it's an aerial photograph taken by the Indian Air Force, but it shows the mountain so beautifully. Um, Everest on the left and uh, the South Call of Everest, the saddle in the middle, and Lhotse on the right, the South Peak of Everest. And Everest has been the goal uh, of many generations of climbers since the 1920s, when the British expeditions first went to the mountain. And it was my dream ever since age 11. And my Everest dream, as you will see, came true. But I also have been very, very fortunate to not only have done a lot of fantastic climbing, but I've been incredibly lucky. I would even say blessed to have met many of the most famous climbers. I never met Tenzing Norgay, seen here standing on the summit of Everest on the first ascent on May the 29th, 1953. I never met Tenzing, but I know his sons. And this is Tenzing Norgay on the left and Sir Edmund Hillary on the right, the first two men to climb Everest. I was so fortunate. I met Sir Edmund Hillary twice. I sat next to him at a dinner party and uh, so utterly memorable. How often do you get to meet one of your childhood heroes? That's, that's a very, very special event in one's life, if you're that fortunate. And so this whole mythology, this whole history of Everest fascinated me when I was a boy. I read every single Everest book I could get my hands on, um, you know, between the age of 11 and about the age of 16. And so I've actually written quite a lot about the history of Everest. Everest itself, 
was not discovered to be the highest mountain on earth until about 1852, when a British surveyor surveying the mountain with a theodolite from the, from the foothills of the Himalaya in Northern India, he finally was able to ascertain that that peak in the center with the cloud over the top, that was actually the highest mountain in the world. And Everest was called Peak 15, but then it was named for Sir George Everest, who was the surveyor general of this great survey of India that took about 70 years. And so here's a picture of George Everest that the mountain is named for. Um, he didn't want the mountain to be named for him. He wanted it to have an, a local name. Um, I was telling Mark a little history of Mount Washington. How many of you know the local name of Mount Washington? Aki Okachuk, an, Ab an Abenaki name. And if you look up Mount Washington on Wikipedia, Mount Washington, comma, also known as Agiokachuk, comma. So, but most people don't know the native names, but Everest wanted the native name to be used, but before he passed away, he's, he relented and said, okay, you can name it for me. The irony is, how did George Everest pronounce his family name? Everest, like Eve, Everest. And he got really ticked off when people mispronounced his name and called him Everest. So there you go, another wrinkle in history. It turned out that Mount Everest seen here from Tibet actually did have a native name, a Tibetan name, Chomolongma, usually translated as the goddess mother of the world or the goddess mother of the snows, Chomolongma. There's also a Nepali name, Sagarmartha, which means the forehead of the sky. And that name was invented by the ne Nepalese government because they didn't have a name for Mount Everest that was native and they wanted one. So in the 1960s, they made one up, Sagar Martha. So how do you become an Everest climber when you grew up here in New England? This is me on the left when I was about 10 and my younger brother, Mark, my dad took this picture. And so hopefully, you know, your parents are hikers. They, maybe they, they belong to the Appalachian Mountain Club. Hopefully you join the scouts when you're growing up and you go out hiking and camping and exploring the White Mountains and the mountains of Maine and Vermont. And so as I became, I learned to rock climb at age 11 on a 30 foot cliff near my house in Lexington, Mass, where I grew up. But when I was 13, I came up to North Conway and promptly got rescued off White Horse Ledge. <laughs> I came back a year later when I was 14 and did it. <laughs> so anyway, that was the beginning of my climbing in the White Mountains. And then when I was in my 20s, I worked as a climbing instructor for IME, or International Mountain Equipment. Uh, some of you may know Rick Wilcox, who's the owner of International Mountain Equipment. So uh, I, I began my climbing career really in the White Mountains. I also lived in Colorado for 20 years. Now I live on the coast of Maine. But Everest was always, always in the back of my mind. How am I going to get to Mount Everest? Well, at the age of 28, I was living in Colorado. I was directing a climbing school out west. And I heard through the grapevine that some American climbers in Colorado and California were organizing an Everest expedition for 1985, for the spring. And I got, I became friends with one of the leaders of the trip. Someone dropped out of the expedition. And at the last minute, that sort of 10th hour, about three months before we left, I got invited to go on the expedition. Do you want to go to Everest, Ed? We all talked about it and we all agreed on it. Do you want to be part of the team? Yes, totally. You know, I was so excited. I mean, just one of these earth shattering experiences where your life is never the same afterwards. All of us have these little epiphany moments where your life might have been going in this direction, but then you meet someone, something unexpected happens and your life goes in that direction instead. And so when I was 28, my life went to Mount Everest. And so 
I'm in the back there with sunglasses on. Our Sherpas here in the foreground. This is a very traditional expedition. Um, about 20 American climbers, maybe 16 of us, and then uh, Sherpas helping us as well. If you look carefully in the center row, there's a woman named Heidi Benson wearing a pink uh, muff around her neck. And uh, Heidi was the only woman on our team. It was very unusual back in the 1980s for a woman to go to Everest. Now it's totally commonplace. Many women have climbed Everest. But back in these days, uh, it was very unusual. Still friends with Heidi after all these years. Oops, excuse me. And so we had a very big expedition. We had Apple Computer was one of our sponsors. Don't I wish that I had bought stock in <laughs> Apple in 1985. I don't know if any of you use Apple computers, but that is maybe the third or the fourth computer Apple ever made. It's called an Apple II C. And uh, so they gave us about $10,000 and a couple of computers and a banner. So I took this photo at base camp. We had oxygen bottles as well. And these are old fashioned oxygen bottles. They weighed 20 pounds a piece and they were made of an aluminum alloy. So these are the heavy ones. Um, about 15, 20 years ago, some Russian climbers invented a new type of oxygen bottle made of Kevlar and titanium. And that bottle weighs eight pounds versus 20 pounds for one of the aluminum ones. So this is why you needed Sherpas. You needed Sherpas to help you carry the oxygen bottles up the mountain, um, all your equipment. And here are two of our Sherpas helping out um, partway up Everest. Sir Edmund Hillary built schools for the Sherpas and uh, they all speak fluent English. They're very well educated. They're quite Western actually in some of their uh, mannerisms and, and, and relatively wealthy at this point. Um, for, for Nepalis. They live in the high mountain valleys of Nepal, directly below Everest. So if you go on a trek up to Everest base camp in Nepal, you will be hiking through the Sherpa villages and you will meet them. But they are the nicest people, the most positive, friendly, hardworking souls that you'll ever meet. Great fun to be with. And sorry, I'm going to do this manually. And so on this expedition in 1985, I turned 29 years old. And you can see that, again, the Everest dream came true. I'm climbing on the highest mountain on earth with the Sherpa climbers. I'm seeing vistas and panoramas like this. This is another one of my favorite photos I took on my first trip. My partner, Fletcher Wilson, who uh, lived in North Conway actually for a while. And so, Slowly, we're establishing a series of campsites up the mountain. On this particular climb called the West Ridge Direct, one of the hardest routes on Everest, there were seven, might have even been eight campsites. I'm losing track of how many there were, but there were many campsites. And I got to camp uh, three, actually. So there were still several campsites to go. I got to 24 and a half thousand feet above sea level on this expedition. I was chosen to go on this first expedition, not because I was a high altitude climber, but simply because I was a good climber. I was a good rock climber and ice climber. I'd written a lot of articles and published a lot of photographs about Everest. The other reason though, I think I was invited to go, and this is a very important reason, maybe one of the most important, you have to be a good climber, but you also have to be somebody that's fun somebody that's enthusiastic, somebody that's outgoing, that likes to be with other people, that really is a team player that you can count on. And you really need to have that kind of outgoing, positive, dynamic person when you're on a mountain like Everest, because there's a lot of difficulties because of the altitude, the cold weather, just the arduousness and the danger of the climb. You need really solid people to go with you. So I was delighted. I got 10,000 feet higher on Everest than I'd ever been in my life on any other mountain. I'd climbed some 14,000 foot mountains in Colorado. 
but I got to 24 and a half thousand feet on Everest in 1985. And so this is some stormy weather partway up that climb. Two of my partners on this expedition, Robert and Jay, managed to get 800 feet from the summit on the West Ridge Direct. And they, they had trouble with their oxygen gear. They had bad rock and bad weather. They didn't quite pull it off. But none of us actually felt like we had failed because we had tried so hard. We've been living on Everest for two and a half months, you know, three months. We've been living the dream. So we didn't get to the summit on this climb, but this expedition, in hindsight, was a sort of springboard where several of us on this team, about five or six of us, we came back to Everest. We returned to the Himalaya within the next few years and did other big climbs. And this was sort of the starting expedition, the springboard. Now, I had something really bizarre happen on the way back from this first trip. A helicopter landed at a monastery when I was hiking back down. Some of you might have heard of the Sherpas have a big monastery called Tangboche, Tangboche Monastery. It's the Sherpa, the Tibetan Buddhist monastery of the Sherpas. And the helicopter landed in 1985. There were only three helicopters in Nepal. They all belonged to the king, the royal family. And so, well, somebody jumped out of the helicopter and then I saw someone else. And this ne Nepalese man who was a guide, he walked over to me and he, he got out of the helicopter and came over to me and he said, Ed, I met you at a party in Kathmandu two or three months ago. Oh, I'm sure you don't remember me, but I am the guide for Mr. Billy Squire, the American rock and roll star. He is going up to Mount Everest in the helicopter. You have been on Mount Everest, correct? Uh, yes, I just got off of Everest a few days ago. Well, you must go in the helicopter with Mr. Billy and show him the mountains, like show Billy which mountain was which. And so I get in the helicopter, I meet Billy Squire, who's this multimillionaire rock star who I still know. And, and so I take one of my best photographs on that helicopter ride the gods rays over Everest, the sun coming down and refracting through the plexiglass window of the helicopter. It looks like it's underwater, a lot of people say, but it's a very special picture. And here is me and Billy Squire after the helicopter ride. Okay, who's the rich rock star? Uh, the one on the right. That's me on the left. So anyway, 29 years old, having the greatest time of my life in Nepal, going to Everest and topping it off with a free helicopter ride up to Everest with a rock star. Mm -hmm. And then within a couple hours, I'm back in Kathmandu. I got a helicopter ride back to Kathmandu. Uh, Mercedes picked us up. We're at the best hotel in Kathmandu, presidential suite. I just went on and on. Anyway, it was an amazing way to finish an Everest trip. Now, here's the Great Wall of China. It never, in my wildest imaginings, I never ever thought that I would go back to Mount Everest again. Because remember that in the 1980s, because there was no guiding on Everest, you could not actually pay someone 50,000 bucks or 60,000 bucks to be guided up Everest. You had to be chosen and picked to go on an Everest expedition. So you had to really be a proven climber and have a, a bit of a reputation in the climbing world in order to be chosen for an Everest team. And so I never thought I would be lucky enough to get asked to go to Everest again. But six months later, after I got home, I met a Canadian climber who was living in Colorado at the time. And he was organizing an Everest expedition for the following summer. He was going to solo Mount Everest without oxygen bottles, a totally outrageous thing to do. And Roger Marshall needed a photographer to go with him to take pictures of him climbing because he was climbing alone. Very dangerous thing to do. So Roger needed a photographer who also had high altitude experience and he invited me to go. And so at age 30, 
This is like a fairy tale, I know. I mean, it's hard for me to believe that this all happened, which is why I had to write my book, Snow in the Kingdom, because I thought, you know, nobody's ever gonna believe this story. That this, this kid who grew up in Lexington, Mass, you know, in the suburbs of Boston, who learns to climb in North Conway when he's 13, that he's gonna go to Everest three times within five years, but I did. So Roger invites me to go. And in the summer of 1986, when China was really red communist red China, we flew to Beijing. We traveled by train, these rickety trains across China. We flew over the Himalaya to Lhasa, the capital of Tibet. And then we bounced on these Jeeps, in these Jeeps and army trucks on dirt roads for four days until finally we came over this hill and there was Mount Everest right in front of us. And so you can see the plume blowing off Everest. This is looking due south. So Nepal is over the crest of the range there. Um, the east side of Everest is to the left below the plume. And so Chomolungma, the goddess mother of the world. And so on this expedition, Roger was attempting to solo climb the original British route up Everest. You may have heard of the climbers, George Mallory and, and Andrew Irvin, or Mallory and Irvin. It's one of the, it is the most famous mystery in the history of mountaineering. On June the 8th, 1924, Mallory and Irvine made an attempt to reach the summit of Everest in tweed jackets with you know, manila ropes and hobnail leather boots. They were last seen within a thousand feet of the top. They had oxygen bottles, very primitive oxygen gear, steel bottles, and they disappeared into, into a storm and they were never seen again. But they were within a thousand feet at the top. They were on the left-hand ridge, just to the left of the summit. And uh, in 1999, Mallory's body was found on Everest. Uh, more clues came to light about what might have happened. Mallory had fallen probably twice. The rope had broken. He had a broken leg. He had a puncture wound through his forehead. His ice axe may have punctured him through his forehead. It's a complicated story, but if you want to read it, there's a book called The Ghosts of Everest about this expedition. And Tom Pollard, who was on that expedition, Tom lives in Intervale and you may be familiar with him. So Tom Pollard is another local climber like myself, who's also been to Everest multiple times. And Tom helped discover the body of George Mallory. And uh, Mark Sinnott is another local climber from Jackson. And he led an expedition last year that Tom also went on that was trying, trying to find the body of Andrew Irvin, Sandy Irvin, who's never been found. They, Mallory and Irvin had cameras, Cameras have never been found. Irvin's never been found. So Mark Sinnott and Tom tried to find uh, Irvin's body, but were unsuccessful. Anyway, Ghosts of Everest. There's another book called Detectives on Everest that's also a good one. So Roger's trying to climb up that sunny slope in the middle of the face, the, the, the bottom center of the photo. I'm sorry, my laser pointer doesn't seem to be working here. It should have been. Ah, it is. Oh, look at that. So this is, the, this is the original British route up here. This is called the North Call or the North Saddle, Saddle up the North Ridge. Mallory and Irvine disappeared up here. Mallory's body was found right there. So anyway, Roger's going to attempt to do this climb. But while we were there, there's another mountain right to the right here. And this is called the North Peak of Everest. It was named by George Mallory. It's called Chanksy. And, uh, and I said, Roger, I want to do a climb too. I want to solo climb the North Peak and I'll get pictures of you from a great vantage point. Okay, Ed, you can try it, but be super careful and don't get killed, is what he said. And so I went up on the North Peak of Everest seen here. This entire face, the east face of the mountain was unclimbed. I love doing climbs that have never been done called first ascents or new routes. I've actually done over a hundred first ascents in the White Mountains. You get to name them. You get a little piece of yourself sort of gets immortalized on the rock. And doing the first ascent in the Himalaya, 
pretty darn exciting. So the first day I tried it, I did a brand new climb right up through here, but I could not do this last section. It was too steep, rotten rock and sugary snow, very dangerous. So I came back down, I rested for a day, and then I tried plan B. So here's plan A. Plan B went right up the middle of the face, right up there. This was the crux right here. This was pretty sketchy as well. And then up the ridge, and this is how incredibly beautiful it was. So this was a brand new climb up the north peak of Mount Everest. I think I was the first American to ever climb the north peak. It doesn't get climbed very often because it's right next to Mount Everest. If you spend all that money and effort, you wanna to go to Everest. So anyway, this is the North Peak. That's Everest on the right. The third highest mountain called Kanchenjunga is over here. If you look really carefully, there's my footsteps right there. And when I got to the top, 24,800 feet above sea level, I felt like a new man. And I was having a bad day with my hair. <laughs> so kind of like when you're, you know, you're out skiing for the whole day and you take your hat off, you know, you have bad hair. Oh, and by the way, I'm up on top of the mountain alone. It's a selfie. I'm one of the inventors of the selfie. <laughs> I actually started, I actually started taking pictures of myself solo when I was climbing alone back in 1977 was the first time I did it. I was in a photography class out West. In Colorado. And so here I am in 1986. I'm 30 years old. And this one turned out pretty well, huh? So how do you take a selfie if you didn't have an iPhone? You have a 20, uh, a 22 millimeter lens, a wide angle lens. And no, it's a 24 millimeter lens. And you focus the lens of the camera uh, carefully on your fingertips. And you hold the camera in arm's length, press the shutter button, you pray that the picture is in focus on your nose or your eyes, and then you get a good selfie. I didn't actually get to the summit of the North Peak. I stopped about 60 feet from the top because the Sherpas and Tibetans told me the mountains are sacred. We believe the gods live on top of the mountains. So out of respect for the gods, you should stop a little bit below the top. So I stopped. This is me with the summit right behind me. And this is the view I had of Mount Everest. Earlier, I showed you the poster I brought. I have a poster uh, made of this image. All my posters are over there. They're $20 a piece. You can email me at Webster at mtnimagery.com if you want to get a poster. So just email me. But there it is, the entire north side of Mount Everest from just below the summit of the North Peak. In the monsoon, it was August the 28th, 1986. Lots and lots of snow on the mountain. And here we are, we'll zoom up a little closer here. So George Mallory's body was found right here, below this triangle here. And most climbers agree this is their high point called the second step. This is called the first step. But what happened to Irvin, nobody knows. It's a bit of a mystery still. So this particular success that I had, soloing a brand new climb up the North Peak, prepared me for the biggest climb of my whole life, a brand new route up Mount Everest, up the most remote side of the mountain, the east side or the Kangshan face. Down below here is the Kangshan Glacier, the east side glacier of the mountain. And this side of Everest, this is Everest here. This is Lhotse, the fourth highest mountain. Perspective in the, where I took the camera, took the picture from, makes it look like the higher mountain, but it's the fourth highest mountain. That's the summit of the world. That's Everest. This is called the South Call, the saddle. So why this side of the mountain is all draped with snow is because the, the wind, the plume, the jet stream, blows all the snow from the west side of the mountain. They're westerly winds. So all that loose snow and ice gets blown over the summit and over the summit ridges. And on the leeward side, the east side, all that snow filters out. And so that's why you have all these gigantic snow fields known as a hanging glacier. And where the glacier breaks off, these huge ice cliffs, that gives you this tremendous uh, repository of snow and ice 
these small glaciers at the bottom of the mountain. But these cliffs right here are 4,000 vertical feet high. That's Cannon, the face of Cannon Mountain times four, where the old man is, just to give you some perspective. Um, in Mount Washington, 6,288 feet. So this is 4,000 feet. So from the glacier to the summit, hard to believe, it's 12,000 vertical feet high. So this is Mount Washington from sea level times two. The scale is hard to grasp. And so we organized an expedition to do this brand new climb up Everest. And we had a really hard time finding people who wanted to go with us because of the avalanche danger. And because also we wanted to do the mountain in the style that these two gentlemen had climbed Everest. These are two of the fa most famous mountaineers in history. On the right, Reinhold Messner. On the left, Peter Hobbler. From Italy, Messner and Austria, Hobbler. They were the first men to climb Everest without oxygen bottles back in 1978. They climbed in lightweight, fast, ethical style. And we wanted to climb like Messner and Hobbler, but we wanted to do a brand new route up Everest. And so in the end, we end up going to the mountain with a team of four climbers, a very, very small team, because a lot of climbers turned us down. David Brashears, who did the IMAX Everest movie, he directed it, an old friend of mine. David, do you want to go to Everest and do a new route up the mountain, uh, up the Kangshung face? No thanks, Ed. Give me a call if you get home. <laughs> that's what David said. So just the four of us. So that's me on the left, age uh, 30. And this is uh, Robert Anderson from Colorado, the other American on the team. Robert led the trip. Paul Tier is from Canada and Stephen Venables is from England. So warmly welcome the Mountaineers from three countries. This sign was for another expedition, but we were from the USA, Canada and Britain. And so with this very small team, only four climbers, we also had a doctor, a photographer, a Sherpa cook and a Tibetan cook boy. We had eight people at base camp, no radios at all. We wanted to be away from the world. We wanted to just be off by ourselves. The approach was incredibly complicated. It took us uh, an entire month to get to base camp, traveling across Nepal. Part of us went across Nepal, part of us came through uh, China and Tibet. And then we met in Tibet. Um, we were sponsored by the way, uh, by Kodak, Rolex watches and uh, American Express and a pharmaceutical company. And we were in a Rolex ad for 10 years. They climbed Everest without oxygen bottles, but not without Rolex. <laughs> oh no, this is a Casio draft. Anyway, I do have an engraved Rolex at home. Everest 1988. So here's Stephen Venables, very happy that he accepted our invitation because here is the most remote side of Everest, the east side. And you never see pictures of this side of Everest. I mean, this is the unknown side. To this very day, there are only two books about this side of Everest, one written by my partner, Stephen, and my book, Snow in the Kingdom. And that's it. Those are the only books about this whole side of the mountain, which is fully about a third of the mountain. It's about a third of the whole mountain. Now, earlier I told you about perspective, how hard it is to gauge how big Everest is. Do you see the person right there? There's a person. Straight up, there's the summit of Everest. So there's a person in the lower foreground walking across the snow. And if you go directly above that person to the top, that snowy peak, uh, the highest peak is Everest. So this is why it took us so long, so complicated, the logistics, getting all our equipment to base camp. We had 150 uh, Tibetan uh, Sherpas or, or Tibetan uh, villagers helping us carry our equipment. Here's me on the final day of the approach. Mount Everest is actually at the back of the valley there. This is Everest here. And so after this long, long approach, we finally reached our base camp here at about 17,000 feet above sea level. So it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around that, that you're now at 17,000 feet above sea level. And this is your home 
for the next two and a half months. This is the bottom of Everest. Everything else higher. So there's our cook tent, our Sherpa, our Sherpa friend and cook uh, Pasong, who also spoke fluent Tibetan, so he was our interpreter as well. We had a puja ceremony or a good luck ceremony here, a, a Buddhist blessing ceremony. And boy, you wanted a lot of good luck because this is what we had traveled halfway around the world to climb. This incredibly daunting, dangerous side, the unknown, forgotten face of Mount Everest, the Kangsheng face. And so there, this side of Everest actually had been climbed once right up through here, up the right-hand margin of this photo, through the rocks and, and then up a snow ridge to the top by a, an, a large American expedition in 1983. And in 1988, five years later, we went to try to climb this smaller buttress to the left, the rock and snow and ice buttress on the left margin of the picture, leading to a kind of a snow ramp in the sun that angles up and right towards the summit. And so this is our dream. This is our route that we hope to do. Luckily, we had a lot of food and supplies, and that included a jar of, of tang. Now, how many of you remember having tang when you were hiking as a kid? You had to have tang. You see the jar of the can of tang here on the left. On the lower left, everybody, there's a, there's a can that says tang across it with an orange on it. We had, oh, tons of good food. We also, this is Stephen Venables helping on the left, sorting out the food. We also had one woman on our team. This is Mimi Zeman, Miriam Zeman on the right with the blue jacket. And uh, she was our doctor. So Mimi and another fellow named Joe Blackburn, our photographer, who was a Kodak photographer, they didn't actually climb on the mountain. Only the four of us, Robert, Stephen, Paul, and I, we climbed on the peak, but uh, the others were there in support. There's a couple of uh, Tibetan villagers there in the background, and that's Everest behind Stephen. And so we went out across the glacier on a reconnaissance and we set up an advanced camp, an advanced base camp known as ABC, advanced base camp. And my photography was getting pretty darn good, but these are all taken. These are not digital. These are Kodachrome slide film pictures. So this is the old days, this is pre-digital, pre-internet, no cell phones, no internet, no, no weather forecasting, no Google, no Google Earth, no Google Maps. We based our entire hunch that we could do this climb up Everest, this new route, we based our hunch on six photographs, actual photographs that we saw of Everest, of this side of the mountain. Hardly anybody had ever been to this side but we knew some of the American climbers who had made the first ascent of this face, right up the center is a kind of black rocky buttress, not a very attractive climb, but we knew some of the Americans in 1983, some of them lived in Colorado, who had done the first ascent of this face. So then we base our climb to the left up this next buttress over to the left on their pictures. So here's a time exposure, that little squiggle of light, by the way, that looks like a, a lightning bolt in this picture is a headlamp. My partner walked through the picture with his headlamp turned on and it's a time exposure. It took about a minute to take this picture. And then here is the moonlight looking the opposite direction that same evening. Just a beautiful image. The moon rising over Tibet in the Himalaya. But here is what we had chosen as a goal, a challenge. And uh, I gotta say, we were pretty darn nervous when we looked up at this side of the mountain and we saw these immense uh, ice cliffs on the lower left, these huge ice cliffs, these huge uh, avalanches pouring down this side of the mountain. But this left margin of the picture up the snow and ice is actually our route. This is actually what we climbed right there. And the summit of, the, of Everest is in the upper right-hand corner the highest little snow bump on the very upper rightmost corner of the picture. And here's a huge, huge avalanche pouring down our climb. When we heard this avalanche came down, we all ran out of our tents to get pictures of it from advanced base camp. And Robert yelled back to us and said, well, 
that one would have killed us. <laughs> so we had some very sobering moments and, uh, and more, as you'll see. In early April of 1988, I was 32 years old at this point, had my 32nd birthday just before we started the climb. Paul and I, from Paul from Canada, we started out across the glacier very easy, a little higher. Here's Robert climbing. Still not very difficult. We're doing fairly moderate climbing. This is like something on Mount Washington, really. Not harder than anything in Huntington Ravine so far. But then, a day or two later, we encountered an overhanging ice cliff. And it was my turn to lead, to go first. So I've got my purple harness on, which is sitting on the table over there. My Will and harness, that's the same harness. Um, I have a different pair of boots on. Different, the rest of the gear is different, but there's my harness. And uh, so it was my turn to lead, to go first, to figure out the route, to do the route finding. So Stephen was belaying me. He took this picture. So this is looking straight up an overhang of ice on Everest. Hold on to your seats, even those of you at home, you better hold on to something for this next picture. Are you all ready? Everybody <laughs> holding on? Okay, this is looking straight up. And this next picture is looking straight down. Did everybody enjoy that? Okay, let's go do it again. So this is looking straight up and this is looking straight down Everest. The exact same section of the mountain in these two pictures. So very difficult, scary climbing, very technical. And this picture explains why we climbed Everest with no oxygen bottles, because we couldn't carry the extra weight, because we didn't have any Sherpa climbers helping us. We knew that if we invited Sherpa climbers, this climb was way too dangerous for them. Back in the 1980s, the Sherpa climbers were not skilled enough on really technical ground, such as overhanging ice cliffs. So we didn't, we felt it was unethical to hire Sherpas to carry our equipment when probably one of them was gonna get killed because it was just way beyond anything they could handle. And so we, when we planned the expedition, we said to, our, we said to each other, we are gonna to have to do this with no Sherpas at all. And that we only have four guys, one of the smallest Everest expeditions ever. So that means the four of us have to carry every single ounce of gear and food up the mountain ourselves. So no oxygen bottles, too heavy. We're gonna to have to be really purist, very ethical and lightweight. No radios. We're, we're gonna do this together and really trust each other and we're gonna make it happen. So it was a very unusual expedition ethically from how we planned the trip. And in the history of Everest, only six expeditions have ever summited Everest with no Sherpas helping them. And we were, we were number six. So climbing Everest without oxygen, also rare, maybe 300 people have done it now. When we were up there, only about 10 people had done it in 1988. Messer and Hobbler were the first. Um, but climbing Everest without Sherpas, it's like super, super difficult. So we had very lightweight gear, very excellent gear for the times for 1988. Lightweight Gore-Tex tents. This is camp one, right above the overhanging ice cliff. I led this, uh, this vertical wall, which was named for me, it's the Webster Wall, but it fell down about 25 years ago because it's part of a glacier. <laughs> so it's not there anymore. But anyway, there's the Webster Wall. Here's Stephen, my British partner, Stephen Venables, uh, melting snow in the, uh, the cooking pot, which hangs from the roof of the tent with a, with a cartridge uh, below it, butane uh, propane cartridge. So all the water you drink and cook with for soup and tea and everything has to be from snow and ice on the mountains. Everything is frozen. And I kept a diary on the entire expedition. Virtually every day I would sit down and I would write about what was happening. And I did that on my first two Everest expeditions as well. I wrote diaries. I have nine blank books that are filled with my Everest diaries. Remember the book I read, Everest Diary, when I was 11? 
So I use my Everest diaries to write Snow in the Kingdom, my Everest book. And a lot of my friends said it's so incredibly accurate. It's exactly like what happened because I wrote it down every day while it was happening. So that's why my book has five star reviews on Amazon. <laughs> and it took me 12 years. So there I am working on my future uh, best selling Everest book. So we would go up the mountain, get a little higher, then we'd go back down our fixed ropes. We'd repel or slide back down the ropes, back to the bottom, trudge across the glacier, go back to base camp. Our Sherpa cook would make us pancakes and yak, potato yak stew, and we'd have great meals. We'd go back up the mountain, and then we'd get up in the middle of the night and have a Pop-Tart for breakfast. Yum. <laughs> this is the, the traditional uh, hiking climbing food. Fro frosted sprinkles, frosting with sprinkles on a Pop-Tart. Maybe not the healthiest, but hey, a lot of carbos and some sugar. So this is the middle of the night at Camp One. This is a nighttime photo I took of Everest that I love. This is our route in the center. And those four white lines in the sky, those are stars because it's a time lapse. So the earth is rotating. The stars aren't moving, but the earth itself is rotating and the stars are staying still. And that's the summit of Everest hiding under a cloud on the upper right. Then we had what Stephen called the little surprise. We encountered a crevasse 100 feet deep, about 40 feet wide across the top and about 10 feet wide at the bottom. We had no aluminum ladders with us, like most sort of modern expeditions where you put a ladder across the top of the crevasse and you balance over, walk, walk across the ladder. We didn't have ladders, so we had to go down inside the crevasse then you had to either go left or right in this like crypt. You were in the bottom of the crevasse. It was wickedly scary. And then, well, this happened. So this is inside the crevasse. Robert Anderson and I go down in the crevasse. And 15 minutes before this picture of me, that's me in the red suit here, 15 minutes before this photo was taken, all that ice. See all those blocks of ice I'm standing on top of? 15 minutes earlier, all of those blocks of ice were up above me in one gigantic block of ice the size of a two-car garage. But there was a passageway that went under it. And casually, Robert says to me, Ed, why don't you walk under that thing and look around to the left and see if we can escape out of the crevasse? We'd already looked to the right behind us and it was too dangerous. And I didn't even think of the danger of walking under the ice block. Oh yeah, okay, I'll give it a try. So we're roped together. I have my purple harness on. Robert puts me on belay. He's protecting me. I go across the bottom of the crevasse. There's a little snow ledge, but I suddenly thought the snow ledge looked friable, like it might break. And I could plunge into the bottom unseen you know, depths of the crevasse. I still wasn't thinking about the ice block. So I stopped and I hammered in an ice piton. You can just barely see it right there. In the bottom of the picture, right in the center, the rope goes through some snow and you can just see a speck, a round speck of metal. And that's an ice piton. So I'm hammering on that ice piton and the ice was really thick and rubbery and I'm pounding on it harder and harder and harder. And suddenly I heard this gigantic explosion. Oh my God, the ice block, it just exploded. And I ran back towards Robert and Robert was screaming at me, Ed, Ed, are you okay? Are you okay? And I'm screaming back at him, I'm okay, I'm okay. I'm standing right next to you, I'm okay. <laughs> <gasps> and the adrenaline was just unreal. I mean, it was so loud and deafening, like an atomic bomb had exploded. And finally, it gets quiet. <gasps> and we're hyperventilating like crazy. And Robert looks at me and he goes, okay, okay, I think it's safe now. Well, why don't you go back over there and I'll take your picture. <laughs> so, I, so I walk back over, I stand on top of the ice blocks, Robert takes my photo, and then I said, okay, I'm just gonna climb right up the other side. And this is like ice climbing in Crawford Notch. 
you all seen people climbing on Frankenstein Cliff up in Crawford Notch in the winter. This is the same kind of thing, vertical to overhanging ice climbing. So luckily I had climbed a lot of vertical and overhanging ice in the White Mountains in Colorado. And so this, but to do something like this on Everest at 23,000 feet above sea level, we're 3,000 feet higher than the summit of Mount McKinley of Denali in Alaska. So I led out of the crevasse. We named the crevasse. We had to come up with a good name. The Jaws of Doom <laughs> was the name of the crevasse. Then we set up a rope bridge across this gap, which was 40 feet wide. The left-hand part above my head here goes to the summit. The right-hand part of the crevasse goes back to base camp. And so this is the rope bridge. And so we threw a rope across. We eventually anchored the rope on both sides, the uphill and the downhill side of the crevasse. And we made this rope bridge. And it was crazy. No one's ever done anything like this again on Everest. I mean, we're, this is the highest altitude rope bridge that I think anybody's ever made. 23,000 feet, like 7,000 meters above sea level. So we do the rope bridge, and then we decide to go back to base camp and rest. Base camp is back here um, at the bottom of the glacier, the, sort of the top of the glacier in this picture. And so oh, and here, before we went down, though, Stephen had to go across. So this is Stephen going across the rope bridge. So we did a lot of kind of crazy shenanigans. We got back down to base camp and we decided, okay, now we need to take photographs for our sponsors. <laughs> and one of our sponsors was a cosmetic company, cosmetics company in New York City called Kiehl's Cosmetics. They're in a lot of airport transit lounges around the world. You may have seen them before. They make really high quality cosmetics. So they gave us ski racing bibs. <laughs> with Kiehl's Cosmetics on them. So here we are posing for our, our sponsorship photo. This photo is in some of the Kiel stores to this very day in color. And then we came down and there was a sculpture. <laughs> there was a sculpture at our advanced camp. And Joe Blackburn, who was our photographer, he was the only married person on the trip. We, the rest of us were single at the time. And so Joe was homesick for his wife and he made this beautiful sculpture of his wife. And so naturally we had to have our picture taken with the lady, the, the ice lady. And so there we are with the, the ice woman that Joe made. But what I love about this picture is you can really see we're having fun. The climb was incredibly dangerous. It was incredibly scary. It was incredibly risky, but we really had a fun time together and we really bonded like nothing else. So that's left to right, that's Stephen Venables, Paul Tier making fun in the middle, my Canadian partner. They always have a good sense of humor, the Canadians. And then Robert Anderson on the right, who led the trip. So we'd been up and down 12 times, carrying equipment and food and loads up to camp one. We'd actually been to camp two. Camp one is right here. We'd already been up to camp two, which is up here. And the summit is up, up there in the center. Kind of hard to see in this picture. So now we went back up to Camp One. It was the beginning of May of 1988, and it was about May 7th. And we decided, okay, this is it. We're going for the top. We're as well trained as we possibly can be and acclimatized. We're ready to try to get to the top. So we go back to Camp One, where I got this amazing photo. I love this picture of Robert cooking with the beautiful clouds, the sea of clouds. In the mountains in Tibet behind him from Camp One. The next day we continued climbing up to Camp Two on easier climbing. This is above the Jaws of Doom. We had to go across the Jaws of Doom again, the rope bridge, hanging in our harnesses and pulling ourselves across hand over hand and then pulling our, our backpacks across with carabiners like a little zip line. And then wallowing through this deep snow for 12 hours up to camp two, above the sea of clouds. Stephen Venables took that photo. And so camp two was right here. And it was at 24 and a half thousand feet on Everest. <clears throat> it was a nice flat ledge with an overhang of ice that projected above it. When we first got there, we thought, well, this is great because if any avalanches come down, they'll shoot off over the eaves of the uh, overhang 
and we'll be safe underneath. But the next day, when I climbed around the right-hand side, this is me leaning away the following morning, I looked back to my left and I realized that this entire overhanging wall of ice was completely detached from the rest of the mountain, like a gi another giant block of ice. If there had been an earthquake, it would have fallen right over. But we ended up sleeping there two more nights on the way down. But anyway, it's another story. So this day, we named it the Great Day. We finished our new route up Everest to 26 thousand feet above sea level. 10 more hours of really strenuous climbing at altitude. The wind picked up just before we reached the south call of Everest, seen here in this photo. 100 mile an hour winds were blasting across the south call, the south saddle of Everest seen here. One of the most desolate places on the planet. Snow and ice and rock and sky and nothing living very high altitude, 26,000 feet. This is the beginning of the death zone, the final 3,000 feet on Everest, it's known as the death zone, where human beings just can't be living for more than a day or two. We were up here without oxygen bottles for four days and four nights, and somehow we survived. So we got our tent set up, 100 mile an hour winds, none of us could sleep that night. The following morning, Paul Tier from Canada was also up here. So Robert, Stephen, Paul, and myself, the four of us, we get up here. We've done our new route. We've joined Hillary and Tenzing's route. Now it's known ground. But the following morning, Paul is sick. He has cerebral edema, where your brain, the water between your brain and your skull swells, and, and you get a buildup of fluid, and it can kill you within a day or two. And so Robert Anderson came over. Uh, Stephen and I were in the left-hand tent. Paul and Robert were in the right-hand tent. And Steve, Robert came over and said, Ed and Stephen, Paul's sick. He's got, he's got the beginning of cerebral edema. He's got to descend right away. I would like either you, Ed, or you, Stephen, to go down with Paul. We can't send him down alone. One of us has to go with him. Would you ever send a sick or an injured climber down a mountain alone? No. That's one of the golden rules of climbing that you must never break. Anybody who gets sick or injured, you hold them, you hold their hand, you take them to the nearest medical facility until you get to a place of safety where they're gonna be okay and taken care of. So one of us would have to go down with Paul. That would mean that two people were going down, leaving only two people to go up and try to get to the summit, which is in the clouds here above the tents. So, we talked about it a little bit, Stephen and I, but then the next moment we heard Paul get ready. Paul came over and joined us. And Paul said, I don't want one of you to come down with me. I think if I leave right now, I can get down alone. We've worked so hard to do this climb, make me proud. One of you get to the top. I'll see you when you get down. All four of us were sobbing. We were all in tears. It was super emotional. And Paul simply took his backpack, stood up, turned around, and left. So within 15 minutes of this whole thing starting, Paul was gone. He just left. And we knew that we might have to make that sort of ultimate step or sacrifice, and Paul did it. Because he knew that we would be safer if three of us were attempting the summit instead of two going up and two going down. And so anyway, Paul took the decision, he left. He seemed like he was in control, Paul left. We didn't have any radios, we couldn't check up on him, he just left. So now, Stephen and Robert and I, the three of us are up there by ourselves. We have no Sherpas, no radios, no oxygen gear. That afternoon, it was on May 11th, 1988, the wind stopped, the weather became absolutely perfect. Okay, this is it tonight. Let's leave at midnight or let's leave at 11 o'clock actually is when we left. So in the middle of the night, the route, by the way, you can see it in this picture, goes across the middle of the South Call, this, this uh, snow platform above Stephen's head here, and then directly up a snow gully just to the left of a rock promontory 
and then up the middle of the face, up into the clouds towards the summit, up the triangular face of Everest, leading up into the clouds. And that's the jet stream at sunset in this photo at six o'clock at night. Um, this was on May the, 10th, uh, May the 10th. Anyway, so here's a picture that Stephen took of me on the right and Robert on the left at 11 o'clock at night on May 11th as we left our tents and started for the summit, just the three of us. We climbed all through the night and finally, I noticed that the sun, that the morning sky was beginning to lighten. And I looked off to my left and I saw one of the most beautiful sights you could ever see, the spiritual image of the shadow of Mount Everest projected across to the Western horizon by the rising sun. I took off my outer layer of gloves. I had two layers of gloves on, big thick over mitts and thin liner gloves. I took off my over mitts, I took a quick photograph of the shadow. Thank God it turned out really well. I took it with a pocket camera that was an autofocus camera. Then I turned around and this is what I saw next. This amazing sunrise. I may never be up here again, I thought. I should photograph this. I took my gloves off a second time, my outer layer. I still had liner gloves on. And this time I pulled out my heavy camera, my Nikon, my FM2 manual Nikon. And I took impulsively eight photographs as fast as I possibly could, but it was 30 degrees below zero. And the metal of the camera burned right through my liner gloves and froze my fingertips in less than two minutes taking these pictures. And so this beautiful photograph of the sunrise on Everest, I became, I know, I named the frostbite sunrise. It's a very expensive photo. I lost eight fingertips taking this picture. The good part of the story is the photo turned out really, really well. It's a gorgeous picture. I think it's still one of the best sunrise photos from the mountain. The highest mountains on earth, four of the highest mountains in the world, right at dawn. And this picture is in Snow in the Kingdom, the frostbite sunrise. But as the day went on, the wind picked up, it became uh, stormy, the snow began to swirl around. And you'll notice in this photo how dangerous it is. We have no rope, no safety line whatsoever. There are no Sherpas here, no one to show you where to go. One slip and you're going to fall into a blue. So this was by far the most dangerous day of climbing of my whole life. And this is why very, very few people climb Mount Everest in the 70s and 80s, because there was no big ladder of fixed rope, like a handrail of fixed rope, 3,000 feet of fixed rope that there now is every spring and autumn, the Sherpa climbers who live here, they put in a handrail of rope that goes all the way up the mountain from the high camp on the south call all the way to the summit. So you can't get lost. You can't get lost. You can't really fall either because you're clipped into this rope with your harness. You can still die of, of altitude sickness or frostbite or exposure, but you can't really fall off and you can't get lost because the rope is showing you where to go. But we didn't have any ropes. You couldn't make a single mistake. So higher and higher we went. I began to hallucinate. I started hallucinating. I passed out twice. I still kept climbing higher. And finally, I reached 28,700 feet above sea level with my own lung power. And I suddenly realized in the pit of my stomach, if I go another 15 feet, I'm probably going to die. I just suddenly had this gut feeling that I've reached the end of the, the end of the rope, the end of the, the, the line of, of my line of safety, that if I could keep going and cross this threshold, I'm probably going to be killed. I'm not in control anymore. And, and I honestly, I thought to myself in the next moment, I have other goals and dreams in my life that I still want to make come true. It wasn't that emotional at all when I turned around. And I'm glad that I did because I would have died and I wouldn't be here today. And maybe I had another bigger job to do, as you'll hear in a moment. 
But my British partner was absolutely indestructible that day. Stephen Venables, Robert Anderson got 50 feet higher than I did. He also turned back. But Stephen Venables, my British partner, to this very day, I have no idea how Stephen did it. He continued alone in a storm, in this whiteout, all by himself, without a rope, and he reached the summit of Everest alone. Absolutely one of the most phenomenal summit climbs, I think, in the whole history of Mount Everest. And Stephen climbed up the Hillary step, seen here, that Sir Edmund Hillary led on the first ascent of Everest back in 1953 with Tenzin Norgay. And Stephen took this picture on the summit of Everest that proves that he got there. It's a very strange photo though. Mm -hmm. So what are we looking at? So the, the yellow object that goes up and left at the top, that is a yellow oxygen bottle, one of the aluminum bottles that weigh 20 pounds each. Then there's a Buddhist prayer flag on the upper right hand side of the picture. There's a couple of video bags down below. The Jap Japanese team had climbed the mountain a week earlier and they left the oxygen bottle and the flag, the prayer flag and their little shrine. And Stephen photographed it. The Japanese also photographed it in a book that they later published. And if you look very carefully in the oxygen bottle at the upper left of the screen, at the top of the yellow oxygen bottle, there's a dark figure and that is Stephen's reflection in the oxygen bottle. So it proves without a doubt that my partner Stephen reached the summit of Everest. He was the 216th person to climb Everest. You won't believe it, but today over 6,000 people have climbed Everest. This, that one statistic, you know, really proves how long ago now it was, what a different era it was. Stephen was the 216th person. Robert Anderson and I descended quickly before it got dark and we, we never made it back to the South Call to our camp, but we did find this abandoned yellow tent that the Japanese team had also left behind a week earlier. And right before it got pitch dark, Robert and I crawled into that Japanese tent. We barely slept. We kept looking at each other and thinking, you know, this is how people die up here when things start to go wrong like this, but we made it through the night and the next morning, right at dawn, we came out of the tent and suddenly we looked up, oh my God, a person was staggering down the mountain towards us. It's Stephen, he's alive. And Stephen Venables staggered down the mountain. He looked like a drunken man. He could barely stand up. He was so blown out and so exhausted. He collapsed and sat next to us. I gave him my water bottle to have a drink. He's all covered with snow and ice crystals. And Stephen said to us, I can't believe it, but I did it. I reached the summit yesterday afternoon at 3.30. I spent 15 minutes on top. I took a few photos to try to prove I was there. I really can't believe it. I made it to the summit. And we were so excited. We gave him a huge bear hug and clapped him on the back. It was really emotional. The most amazing thing though of all, I mean, yeah, it's a fairy tale ending for our climb because my partner Stephen made it to the summit, but even better, all three of us had survived two nights climbing on the summit ridge of Everest. And so we gathered together, we staggered back down to the South Call on the morning of May the 13th May 12th was our summit day. And so as Stephen was walking across towards me, he's wearing the purple boots that are on the table over there. Those are the purple boots in the picture. Um, I said, Stephen, hold up your ice axe, smile. I wanna get the victory photo. And so this is the victory picture that was later published around the world. And he was the first British climber to climb Mount Everest without bottled oxygen. So he's kind of a national hero in Britain. We got back to our tents on the South Call. We're still at 26,000 feet. We're still in the death zone. We, we had a cup of tea and we collapsed. Believe it or not, we were so exhausted at this point, we slept for 24 hours. We actually slept for an entire day. I've never done that any other time. The next morning when we woke up on May 14th, we, I realized, and we all realized, if we don't get out of here now, we're probably going to die. 
We could barely stand up. Stephen is on, this is the final picture I took on the expedition. It's the very last photograph that I took. And you can see Stephen is a blob sort of laying in the snow in front of the tent. And he's holding up his gloved hand, waving hello. Because I said to him, Stephen, you look like you might be dead. Could you please prove that you're still alive? <laughs> and he, he waved his hand. So I led the way down the next section, which is from the, the top of the snow ridge in the center, the low part of the snow saddle, is the south call, back down this long rounded snow ridge to the vertical rock cliffs down below. That's our climb. And everything proceeded to go wrong. It's a complicated story. I don't really have time to tell you the whole story, but you'll have to read my book. It's all in Snow in the Kingdom. We ran out of food for three and a half days. Stephen and Robert both fell and they dropped and lost their ice axes. Then we realized that Robert and Stephen had forgotten, but sorry, Robert and Stephen, uh, <laughs> sorry, oh, I'm really messing up now. <laughs> Robert and Stephen had forgotten the, uh, uh, the climbing rope, which is sitting right here below Stephen. So we had no rope, no food, we're all frostbitten, uh, one ice axe between the three of us. Things are really getting bad. So I led the way down the mountain for three days without food. And I think that that was my higher purpose was because I, I effectively saved our team because I led the way down. Stephen could barely stand up. He was so exhausted. We descended most of the route in a whiteout with no rope. This picture where there is a rope was taken also in a whiteout in the same section on the way up. But if you, if you take the rope out of this picture, this is what it looked like on the way down. You'll notice there's a stick. It's a piece of bamboo with orange duct tape, a marker flag. We actually had on the upper section here, five of those marker flags to mark the route. And every time I, I found one of these marker flags, I burst into tears because I knew we were still on the right route. And finally, five days after the summit, we reached the bottom of the mountain. Stephen went first on the final hundred yards. And so it was four o'clock in the morning, it was pitch dark. And suddenly lights came on at advanced base camp and someone wearing a headlamp. We heard people crying and yelling and screaming and someone wearing a headlamp ran out across the glacier to where I was and gave me a big bear hug. It was my friend, Paul, my Canadian friend who had high altitude sickness, cerebral edema, Paul got down safely. How are you? Are you okay? Sort of, I said. And I was still, I was still having a bad hair day, by the way. And Stephen had frozen his nose. And this picture of me that's on the back dust jacket of my book kind of sums it all up. Three and a half days without food, frostbite, the death zone for four days and four nights. But amazingly, so fortuitously, all of us survived. Robert also made it down. And here's a reunion picture with Miriam Zeman, our doctor. From left to right in this picture, this is uh, myself, Mimi, our doctor. Stephen's nose is bandaged. And Robert on the right, he also had frostbite on his hands, but his frostbite healed. It wasn't as bad as mine. And this is what I call the real victory photo when we made it down. And behind us, you can see a bunch of rock cliffs and sort of just to the left of center, this is our new route of Everest. You have to name your climb. We gave it kind of a tongue in cheek name. We called it the Never Rest Buttress or Never Rest. So if you put an N in front of Everest, you get Never rest. And we thought, that's perfect. That's us. Never rest. So Stephen lost probably 25 pounds of weight. He was skinny to begin with, but this is what he looked like when he got to base camp and he took a sponge bath. His nose was frozen. It took a year, but his nose grew back. But all of us lost fingers and toes as well. Stephen lost four toes, but no fingers. Robert lost two toes, no fingers. I lost eight fingertips and three toes. So we all paid a price. Ironically, 
out of the whole team, Paul was the only one who wasn't hurt. He made it down safely in one long day from the top camp all the way down, feeling better and better as he went down and there was more and more oxygen for him to breathe and the symptoms of cerebral edema dissipated. So Paul made it down, that's Paul in the far right. Stephen, left to right, Stephen, Robert, myself in the red uh, shirt, and then Paul. So to this very day, our team is still the smallest team that ever did a brand new route up Everest. Only four guys. And what I think is terrific about our climb is that maybe 100 years from now, people are gonna be reading history books about Mount Everest and they're gonna to get to the chapter number 14 or 15 uh, and they're gonna look at, oh, the Neverest buttress. Oh my God, and they're gonna read about our climb and they're gonna to think to themselves, wow, what got into those guys? <laughs> Why did they climb Everest with a team of four without oxygen bottles, with no Sherpas helping them at all, with no radios? What were they thinking? Well, we just wanted to have a big adventure, just like an adventure you would have on Mount Washington when you were growing up, but we wanted to have it on Everest. And here we are 25 years later, this is our 25 year reunion over in England and Wales. So the other good part of the story about our team, we're fantastically good friends. We always will be. It was a happy expedition. It had a very hard ending but it was a happy expedition. We're still the greatest of friends. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. All the very best, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. That's my first, my first Zoom lecture ever. All right, so do any of you have any questions that you wanna ask? I know we're a little tight on time here. Yeah, yeah it sounds like you got up the new route up yes. to the South Pole. Correct. Then is it the classic uh, route? Yep. Up over the Hillary Step from that point on? Yes. But we actually did a variation that was also partly a new route, as it turned out. When we got caught in the dark, we got lost. And we went too far to the left. We also did a bit of a new route on the upper face. But then we joined the Hillary, the Hillary Tenzing route. It's known as the Southeast Ridge. Yes? Uh, you left routes at the top. Then on the way back, did you, had you left the bridge? Ah, uh, yeah, the rope bridge. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I didn't mention that, but thank you for bringing it up. You know, we were a very ethical expedition. One of the most ethical in the history of the mountain, I think. We always, always had planned that we were going to strip every single bit of equipment, rope, tents, everything off the mountain. But when we were coming down, my hands were so frozen and frostbitten, I could barely hold on to the rope. I had to wrap the rope around my wrist to slide and rappel back down. And we, we, could, we, we abandoned everything, all of our equipment, we abandoned on the mountain. I'm not proud of it, but the only things that we brought down off the mountain were the clothes on our back, our camera, our water bottle, and our film, and one ice axe. And that was it. So sadly, we left several tents up there, probably five or six different tents, sleeping bags. But we'd eaten all our food. There was no more food. But anyway, we did leave equipment behind. I'm sorry to say that, but we did. Uh, it's a it's a minor thing, but yeah. The back in the old film days. Sure. Uh, was it special film? No, regular Kodachrome. No, regular Kodachrome. Oh, yeah, right. And it didn't, it was, you know, it was crap or something. Yeah. You advanced it or something. Exactly. A lot of people have, have said to me, you know, well, did your film ever split or crack because it was 35 below zero? Didn't the slide film break? No, it never did. It never did. None of the slide film broke. I, I never saw a single uh, image that was broken or roll that was broken. Kodak actually processed all of our film for us for free when we got back. Mm -hmm. But it took, you know, months for us to get home. And then finally, we got the slide film back, the slides back. Um, the only picture that Kodak used from our expedition, um, I'm proud to say it was a picture of mine. It was in the crevasse. It was a picture of Robert that I took. And it's in a, it's in a company book 
that Kodak published called The Story of Kodak. It's the complete history of the Kodak company. And my pick, one of my Everest photos is in the back of the book in the sort of new photography, you know, 1988. Um, but it was, yeah, Kodak was a terrific sponsor. Um, I wish they were doing better than they are now. Uh, Rolex, again, a very fantastic sponsor. I met the president of Rolex. They threw a party for us a year after our climb in New York City. We had a reunion and Rolex, Rolex threw the party. And uh, I still have my Rolex watch. So, but you know, like I said, the most important thing, um, the two most important things in my estimation about our climb are that we climbed with a sense of ethics and we tried to do the right thing climb with a small group of friends and just do a climb sort of in an old fashioned way and without a lot of high tech technology, without relying on Sherpas, but just relying on each other and all of our combined experience. And thank God we all, we did it. We all survived. We got hurt, but we survived and we're fantastic friends and we always will be. Thank you very much. We are out of time, uh, but I wanted to thank you so much for this. Thank you, Mark, for having me here tonight in Guilford. Yes, absolutely. it's been a great pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Drop me an email if you want to book or a post.